Well, hello everyone. This is show number seven of Let's Talk Food Travel Live Squared, and I am your host. My name is Andy Asher. Let's do it. We do have a great show ahead today. As a travel destination with a surprise history about it. Uh, there's some luscious chili poppers from Mimi's Kitchen and an acclaimed registered nurse who voices out about becoming disenchanted by the um, hospitals where she worked. Um, she turned her inside knowledge and her experience into helping other people. Today's show was inspired actually 10 years ago when we launched a mouthful now uh, for our name as bloomerboomer.com and it has always been about um, aging can be really the best time ever for older grown-ups like me and like us. It's about the meaning of life squared, the opportunity to live life authentically and it's about how you can be part of our live stream every single Tuesday on your favorite platform, whether it's YouTube or Facebook or BoomerBoomer.com, and there are many others where we stream out to. So let's talk about this week. There is really no escaping the fact that all of us will most likely spend a few hours, if not days, in a hospital, and if you are anything like me, well, they scare the devil out of me. And that brings forth a lot of fear of the unknown. Now, what if you had someone who could ease that fear after spending years as, as a hospital, highly respected nurse, she left her job disillusioned, but also believing that she could help people survive the bureaucracies of hospitals and the errors within the medical system. One doctor isn't serving as the captain of the ship anymore. That is former critical care nurse Terry Deher, who spent years in Chicago in hospitals there, but she became disillusioned with a system that increasingly prioritized the paperwork and the profits over you know, patient well-being. Now she is doing something to make a change. And we start a new season of travel in our travel segment to 11 magical California gold rush towns that you should absolutely visit. We showed you this pan like this. Where's the heavy stuff gonna go? Here, here, or here? We'll start our travels of the uh, gold country shortly. And first, in Nini's kitchen, well, what she can do with one of those modern air fryers, those modern poppers, well, it's in her kitchen and everywhere. And for an expert cook who has savored Mediterranean cooking, uh, Mimi, of all people, has fallen in love with, uh, with the uh, uh, air popper, her air fryer. Let's check in. Hi, Mimi. Hello, hello again. It's me in my kitchen. Today, with this weather, it's cold, it's raining. I am going to make some black bean with some um, black bean and some jalapeno poppers. So I'm gonna be browning my meat, browning the meat with some spices. So first, kosher salt, garlic powder, cumin, chili powder, all right, coriander, all right, pepper, and let it brown. I like that, you know, the meat to be nice and brown. All right. And while this is doing its trick, I'm gonna dice my onions. And then, oh yeah, oregano. You have to put the oregano, so because I, you, wanna, you want it to come out. In, you, you wanna smell it. Mm, so good. All right. 
and all the other spices I'll put them when I put the tomatoes okay I'll talk to you later I'm gonna be dicing my uh, onions finish dicing my onions and my garlic and I'll be right back you know, it is uh, really, really hard to believe that 10 years ago, BloomerBloomer.com started out as the Huffington Post for people over 55. Now, overall, those years, it grew and grew into uh, what's called a higher domain authority. That's a site on Google or a, a classic classification. There was a podcast, video was added a few years later, and now we have a full show every Tuesday live streamed on platforms everywhere now at the uh, end of the show i will i'll tell you three ways that uh, that you can support the show and you can keep let's talk food travel live squared going when we left mimi's kitchen a moment ago she was just getting started um let's check in and see how she's doing all right hi now that my uh, the meat is you know browned and nice I diced some uh, uh, yellow onions, red onions, fresh garlic, uh, poblano pepper, and some uh, cilantro stem. So now I'm going to add them to the meat so they can all get together and just, you know, like that. So this is how I make my black beans. I have, you know, my own way of making it. I love making it this way. All right, now I'm going to put my smoked paprika. A little bit like a hint of cinnamon, like really a hint. All right. I have here some more chilies and a this is so good this is ancho chili yeah you do that you see so nice and flavorful let it just you know soak a little bit and you add your roasted fire roasted tomatoes right like that let it simmer and when all this is ready you add your black beans and that's it and you're done and we're gonna work on the we're gonna work on the jalapeno pop poppers all right it smells so good mm. all right all right I will come back and show you what uh, what I do with those poppers, okay? Thanks, me. See you shortly. In her new book, a nurse turned patient advocate shares potentially life-saving advice on navigating our convoluted healthcare system. Today, uh, I talk to its author, Terry Draher. Now, from the time that she was just a child. Terry knew what she wanted to be. She wanted to be a nurse. But after 30 plus years of being a critical care RN in Chicago at hospitals there, uh, Terry became really disillusioned with the system um, that in her view increasingly prioritized paperwork and profits, you know, over patient well-being. And then how things have changed really in the doctor's office and what you need to know to be your own best advocate. Now, it drove her to write a book which sheds new light on the problems and how people can protect themselves. One doctor isn't serving as the captain of the ship anymore. In fact, the primary care physicians are, are discouraged from going into the hospital because the hospitalists are taking care of people in the hospital. So ask all those questions. If you don't feel comfortable, just 
you know, um, get another opinion if you need to. But a lot of times people don't even know the right questions to ask. And that can be so dangerous um, because we're, we're gone from the days where you just believed and trusted every single thing that the doctor um, says because they don't have as much time anymore. They don't automatically know all your medications, what potential interactions could happen. I see patients at leaving the hospital all the time with no order for appropriate lab work um, in the next few days when new medications are started. So um, it's just a really fast-paced system and if you don't have somebody in your family today with high health literacy like a nurse or a doctor then things get missed and um, people sometimes go to the pharmacy and find out oh yeah that medication is a thousand dollars for the next three months so I'm just not going to fill it. Well there are a lot of options for getting discounted um, medications and everything so you really have to have a whole team. One doctor can't handle everything today and they don't really talk to each other either. <laughs> so. <laughs> well you know in retrospect now I'm beginning I'm beginning to wonder really whether we should have ever thought that that one doctor that one <laughs> primary care physician should have expected to know everything. Yeah well maybe but the system today is um, built on on lots of specialists which means lots more money for the healthcare system. Um, when you have a lot of people, but the doctors simply don't have time to thoroughly go through all the electronic health record on every single one of their patients. So they often will miss the consultant's notes and recommendations and things just fly by and important things get missed all the time. So um, we have a long way to go in our country with better communication, which I find that um, miscommunication is the the number one cause of medical error. So that's why I, I essentially started my own company because it just really bothers me to see crucial information not being passed along that can save a person's life. Yeah, and you actually have said that uh, you've been disillusioned with the medical system. I mean, that is uh, a quite an awakening for uh, a person who's a nurse. Well, Andy, it's a long story, but the bottom line is um, I... I saw the healthcare system from the inside out in 2010 when my father-in-law had a life-threatening condition um, when we were on a cruise ship and he almost died and fortunately because he had an ICU nurse in the family he did not die but when I went back to work a few weeks later I was um, almost fired for strongly advocating for a patient in the hospital. I, I felt that the doctor was not um, thoroughly investigating all the possible causes of a hemorrhagic um, episode. She had almost bled to death three times and when I questioned him about it, he transferred the patient out of ICU. She almost died. I intervened. Um, we did a long four-hour code on her and after the code he had his nurse practitioners go through the chart they found that I had forgotten to scan out a dose of morphine during a very busy code where we gave 34 units of blood and so they tried to fire me on trumped up charges of being a drug abusing nurse and so that was the big light bulb moment I said oh no I'm not going to be able to work in the new new healthcare system and every nurse I talk to when I speak at conferences has similar stories. Nurses do not feel safe being um, whistleblowers in hospitals for good reasons because it's all about money now. now. That's a story worth a big deep investigative report. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well do you think uh, hospitals intentionally try to uh, gouge people? 
No, but they're under intense pressure. Before COVID happened, hospitals were losing money. People think that because of a healthcare system is very, very big and well known and has a good reputation that they're very profitable. Nothing could be further from the truth. Most hospitals pre-COVID um, were running at a two to four percent um, profit margin, and COVID caused almost every hospital in America to just start hemorrhaging money. And thank goodness for all of the government bailouts, but that can't happen forever. And so right now, most hospitals, even the big healthcare systems that I know in Chicago, are desperately trying to stay alive. Um, you'll never see that on the marketing materials they put out, but, um, but hospitals are in deep trouble right now. And more and more of... Um, U.S. healthcare is going to be um, taken care of in the community. They've been talking about that for about 20 years, but now it's really happening. And one of my primary goals with all my clients is to keep them out of the hospital. Well, fortunately, because of the Affordable Care Act, most people have some kind of insurance in this, this um, country of people. Now, the Affordable Care Act, you can't have Medicaid if you're not a legal citizen, but everybody else can have access to Medicaid at least. Now, Medicaid does not give the hospitals a lot of money, but it gives them something. So if people show up in the hospital with absolutely no insurance, then the social workers will immediately apply for them to be on Medicaid. Mm, okay, you know, you're th these kind of revelations, uh, if you will, uh, it's really helpful because uh, it's good to know what people's options are. You know, and, and I think patient advocacy, maybe there are uh, two ways to look at it. Someone from the outside, like yourself, serving as a patient advocate. Otherwise, it's how patients should advocate, advocate for themselves. Isn't that part of it as well? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why um, I wanted to get this book out into the hands of as many people as possible and do a conference. I've I've led, co-chaired uh, at least five different um, patient advocacy symposiums and conferences in the Chicagoland area. But this year, I walked away from those conferences, which were for um, professional patient advocates. I said, now I want to do something for patients. I want to empower the patients. I want to empower everybody out there that's lost and confused. We get clients, Andy, that are doctors that can't figure out the healthcare system. We have nurses. I have a client right now whose mother has a particularly sad form of dementia, and she didn't know what the rules of the game were. So when you go hire a RN patient advocate, you're going to save yourself time frustration and money because we know how to navigate the system. People try to figure this stuff out on their own. They can make lethal mistakes and they can waste so much money. Yeah, well, Neil, we've all heard those horror stories uh, where a hospital slips up and someone ends up dying or a mistake occurred in the operating room. Uh, that is so frightening. What a thought. Well, it is, and everything's so fast-paced right now. It happens all the time, but the general public doesn't understand what happens when a medical error happens in the hospital. When you go in for healing and something bad happens, you either have a drug re reaction or the surgeon leaves a sponge in your abdominal cavity and you get infected, or <clears throat> somebody, God forbid, would take off a wrong breast or a leg or something like that. When those things happen and the hospital recognizes that this is a potential multi-million dollar suit, the first thing they do is go and talk to the patient and family and cut a deal. And, and most of the time they just say, just sign this release that you won't sue us and we will pay for 
everything so you won't get one single bill. But unfortunately, a lot of times um, patients suffer life-limiting problems from that. And honestly, it's getting a lot harder to um, sue for medical malpractice unless there's death or permanent disability today. So you have to be very careful about signing those things just to avoid a hospital bill. You know, Terry, you're making it awfully sound awfully scary to go to the hospital. Ah. Well, <laughs> you know, the truth is it can be. Um, when I have family members in the hospital, I want them to get in and out as quickly as possible. And I'm there every day um, asking the questions um, because things just absolutely get missed all the time. And hospitals themselves seem to not understand a lot of the legal rights that patients have. A lot of things have changed um, because of the patient safety movement in our, our country right now, and we have laws that protect patients, but unfortunately nobody sent the memo to a lot of nurses and doctors so that they don't really understand what HIPAA is and what the 2021 CARES Act is and those kinds of things that um, that really allow family members or and powers of attorney for healthcare or myself to get full real-time access to all the medical records. Most people um, will just believe them when they say, oh yeah, we can't really give you those records until after you've been discharged for two weeks, you can formally request them. That's totally not true. Um, you have a right um, as a patient to have immediate full not homogenized version, but real full access to all of your medical records, even the progress notes where doctors and nurses say bad things about patients sometimes. Well, I, uh, I'll be, I'll admit, sometimes I'm a little bit intimidated, at least I, I feel I should show deference uh, to the doctor. You know, I guess that's okay to a point where you're respectful, but, but what, uh, you shouldn't be scared to ask questions or you shouldn't be concerned about being honest with what you need, but there's times when you think, you know, I should have said this and I didn't. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely true. And we, we tell all of our clients to always write down all your questions in a notebook. And then when you're in the doctor's office, write down all the answers and always get the post-visit summary record at the front desk when you leave. So you can verify your understanding of what changes were made because you really only have between five and seven minutes to ask all the questions, get everything answered in normal circumstances. Very few practitioners today have more than 10 minutes per patient, and then they have to go out and spend 20 minutes charting on them. You uh, I, sometimes it seems a little bit imperfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our, our system is broken right now, and it's nobody's fault. It's just the way it is right now. Um, our country really could not continue to spend the amount of money we were on health care, and so the Affordable Care Act has a lot of really good things, but. The parts that really concern me are um, the excessive documentation and nobody has time to read it. And so there's so many incidents of medical error due to miscommunication. Well, Terry, are you ready for a little lightning round? Now, I know some of these yeah. questions might re require a little more time, but let's give it a shot, okay? Okay, lightning <laughs> round. So why is medical care in America so expensive? Well, it, because we're the richest country in the world. <laughs> so <laughs> starting in the 1950s, doctors started charging a lot of money, and it's just kind of built up. Part of it is greed, but it's a big snowball right now that we really can't roll it back down the hill. Yeah. And what does someone do if they feel they've been overcharged? Well, <laughs> have a professional... Um, look at the bill. Over 80% of hospital bills have errors in them, and there are special healthcare advocates that just go line by line through all the bills. And if any incidence of medical error has happened, you have a right to ask for that entire bill to be erased. For you, what's your opinion of hospital dramas on TV? 
Uh, I think they should have more nurses like me being the consultants to tell them what really happens. <laughs> that would be a good role. That, that I don't think anybody <laughs> has that role that I've seen. And yeah. what's your opinion of New Amsterdam? Oh, I really actually like New Amsterdam. I haven't seen all of it, but um, the drama, I, I like the head doctor um, uh, that plays in there, but everything isn't all romance and relationships and everything in the hospital. <laughs> I mean, it's not like they make it sound so glamorous and everybody's so, you know, wonderful but they do have good stories there and that's one of my favorite ones yeah well terry this is good i i uh, want you just uh give, give us the last bit of, of information about you and how people can find out more oh sure just go to northshorern.com we're in chicago i give away free advice all the time we're in five counties around chicago june 16th we're going to have a big patient advocacy conference um, people can reach out to me at terry at northshorern.com that's t-e-r-i at northshorern.com and i would love to hear from anybody and you can also always go to amazon and get how to be a healthcare advocate for yourself and your loved ones you will learn so much i promise well beautiful we'll have all up on the screen so people can see that uh terry thanks so much and uh, keep on going on oh thank you Andy. Andy, it's always a pleasure. I really appreciated the opportunity today, and you have a blessed day. Thank you, Terry. Let's jump back in in Mimi's kitchen, and we'll see how it's going there. All right, I'm back. So while my black beans are cooking, I cleaned my uh, jalapenos. Do you see that? I took all the seeds out and the white uh, membrane. If you like it too spicy, you can leave some seeds in there. So I prepared a, uh, you know, stuffing with some cheddar cheese, chives, turkey bacon, habaneros, I cut them, you know, to make it even spicier, garlic powder, uh, red onions, and some chives. So now, and salt and pepper, of course. So now I, I scoop a little bit here and I start stuff in my peppers you see that you stuff them like this and this is just bread crumbs that i have here you can put some on top and make it nice and voila and these babies here they're gonna go into the air fryer for eight to ten minutes at 375 Look how, how beautiful this is. And you can add some uh, color to it, like a, a little Aleppo pepper or a paprika, just to make it nice and pretty. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, there you go. I'm going to put some smoked paprika on top. See how beautiful this is? There you go. So I'm going to do all this and then come back and show you how we're going to eat it. I'll talk to you later. Okay, you go. All right. Hi. Now that my uh, the meat is, you know, browned and nice, I diced some uh, uh, yellow onions, red onions, fresh garlic, uh, poblano pepper, and some uh, cilantro stem. So now I'm gonna add them to the meat, so they can all get together and just. You know, like that. So this is how I make my black beans. I have, you know, my own way of making it. I love making it this way. All right, now I'm going to put my smoked paprika. A little bit like a hint of cinnamon, like really a hint. All right. I have here some more chilies and a, this is so good, this is ancho chili, yeah you do that, you see, 
so nice and flavorful. Let it just, you know, soak a little bit and you add your roasted, fire roasted tomatoes, right? Like that. Let it simmer. And when all this is ready, you add your black beans and that's it. And you're done. And we're going to work on the we're going to work on the jalapeno pop poppers. All right. It smells so good. Mm. All right. All right. I will come back and show you what uh, what I do with those poppers, okay? We'll check back shortly, Mimi. Now, for tourists who enjoy, you know, getting away from it all, like me, there is uh, one place that combines rural travel with one of the most historic events in U.S. history. Now, listen to this. The gold rush of uh, 1849 to 1855 that prompted one of the largest migrations in U.S. history with literally hundreds of thousands of migrants across the United States and around the globe coming to California to find gold in the in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada and the mountains there. Now this led to the establishment of boom towns and rapid economic growth and prosperity as well as buildings uh, uh, like railroads and churches and banks to accommodate all these newcomers. Now, the uh, significant increases in population and infrastructure allowed California to you know, qualify for statehood in, in 1850, only a few years after it was ceded by Mexico and facilitated U.S. expansion to, Amer to the American West. Now, today, we begin our new series, 11 Magical California Gold Rush Towns You Should Absolutely Visit. When California became a state in 1846, San Francisco was a sleepy port town with fewer than a thousand people made up of sailors and fishermen, whalers, fur trappers, and mostly living in wood frame shacks around the waterfront. And in January 1848, gold was discovered in the Sierra Nevada foothills and San Francisco was changed forever. All of California for that matter. It uh, changed more than just California. The world, I mean, people, you know, they came from everywhere. Chile, all over, for the gold. The, the miners. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes, but they already knew about gold, these other countries. So they were familiar and... In addition to running the gift shop at the mine, Mary helps kids and adults learn to appreciate its rich history. Almost overnight, the gold rush transformed San Francisco into a booming city filled with makeshift tent houses, hotels, stores, saloons, gambling halls, and shanties. Well, it doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to realize that this is an old jail, a solid jail built out of granite and steel. Marshall Gold Discovery State Historic Park is a 576-acre grassy area encompassing in the riverbank spot where James Marshall discovered gold at the Sutter's Fort sawmill. The sawmill itself is a replica. The original sawmill was washed away years ago. Now the park's Gold Discovery Museum features colorful exhibits that tell the story of Marshall's Eureka moment, as well as that of the indigenous people who lost their land as a result. Today we travel to the town that started it all. On January 24, 1848, James W. Marshall discovered gold on the property of John Sutter near here in Coloma, California. A builder, Marshall was overseeing construction of a sawmill on the American River. Today, Coloma resembles a mining town it once was when the news of the gold brought approximately 300,000 people to California from everywhere in the world. Next week, we take off from Coloma, traveling the twisty, rusty back road of Highway 49, which in itself is a fun adventure you won't forget. Hi, I'm back. Everything is ready now. We're going to plate this beautiful black bean and ground beef with a lot of chilies. All right. Now my jalapeno poppers are ready. 
I'm gonna just limb here okay you can put as much as you want we're gonna put three like that all right some guacamole in the middle a little bit if you don't like guacamole don't add it I like to do that so a little bit of uh, olive oil I'm using the habanero olive oil because I am I love spicy drizzle top with some cilantro wedges of lime you squeeze some on top of the beans and voila so if you like sour cream you can also add some sour cream but i really don't need that so look how beautiful it is and it is so good and amazing and spicy and for this weather it's excellent you can also have some pita bread with it or some chips to your liking so until next time bye thank you mimi and i'll see you next week and i want to thank you so much for tuning in to let's talk food travel live squared if you enjoyed this episode or you you learned something new i want to tell you three ways that you can can support the show and and keep let's talk food travel live square going okay now the number one way is to just get yourself subscribed now every week i am you know bringing on the influencers and the people who can teach you something or have something interesting to share um, so all you have to do is uh, take a moment to hit that subscribe button the number two way now this is uh really the ultimate way to support Let's Talk Food Travel Live Squared and it takes less than a minute. Uh, you can simply write something you know very short and sweet like you know I love the show, it has uh, changed your life or something that you learned. Now I am not exaggerating that I read reviews every day and every single one of them uh, whether short or long it really means everything to me. And so the more reviews means the higher we rank on all those algorithms, uh, which means uh, bigger guests, for example, to take a minute to, you know, to leave, just take a minute to leave a review. And three, share the show with your friends. Just hit that share button. And I am, of course, eternally grateful. And thanks so much for supporting the show. I will see you again next Tuesday for another episode of Let's Talk Food Travel Live Squared.